Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitemout.com and BitemoutLive.com and P.O. Combs Asian Art in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And today is October 1st, Halloween month and uh, 2021. And this is our weekly video uh, as we do every week. Uh, uh, take a look and see how things went over on uh, over at uh, uh, eBay, Catawiki, how th what was going on over on the uh, global member pages or with live auctioneers listings and so forth, sort of get caught up for the week. It's been a busy week around here. We've gotten a lot done. I got a little behind on my, uh, uh, my email replies on the identification assistant stuff because I was away last week from Wednesday until this past Sunday. I took a little bit of a break, got up into the mountains, had a very nice time with my wife and uh, even though it rained for two days, it was still fine, uh, sunny, beautiful. The other two days got some things done, got the house ready for winter and, uh, you know, all that stuff. But anyway, we're back. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, some of you have already seen it. We did a video yesterday on the uh, Asia Week uh, uh, results for Sotheby's. And uh, I've gotten a few emails about it, not, surpri unsurpri not surprisingly, because I, I, we talked a little bit about uh, some of the uh, uh, oddball estimating that was going on and some of the crazy prices that were achieved and how that might have been, how that could have come about. And uh, I've gotten, uh, I got a couple of phone calls from some people affected, and, and that's okay. Um, um, I, uh, some, there's something going on and they have to figure it out. But at any rate, that's what, that what was going on. The other thing I wanted to sh share with everybody today is something interesting. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Garth's was having an auction in uh, uh, Ohio, and they had for sale this, this ivory, uh, uh, tortoiseshell uh, carved uh, Canton tortoiseshell box. This is a wonderful box. They've turned up periodically uh, here and there. And... Uh, as one of our one of our uh, regular viewers here uh, uh, bought it. He also apparently bought a number of things at Asia Week uh, and did quite well for himself. And uh, he sent me some pictures of what he bought this box, and he got it very very reasonably. And I didn't realize how reasonably he got it until I saw all of it. Uh, uh, he, so he sent me some pictures because he was really pleased with the, with with the, with the box and when it came in and. Uh, this is, this is the box after it was cleaned up. That's what it looked like in the photographs. That's what the box looked like after he cleaned it and he got it. He very delicately uh, went over it, got the dust out of it, and uh, the quality it was just absolutely amazing. But the big surprise was, and they mentioned it in the listing, but they didn't show it in their pictures, was the back of it also fully carved which is quite unusual often the backs of these are flat and undecorated this one it did mention it in the listing that the back was decorated with fishing scenes and so forth well here it is and he cleaned it up and he took it outside and he took some nice photographs of it to show just how how good this box was and uh and and, and the interesting thing was he, he actually got it for uh, less, he got it on the low end of the estimate that I thought it would bring. Because in the past, we've seen these these boxes bring sixteen, seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars. Only decorated on the one side. This was de decorated on both sides, which makes it uh, very rare, and uh, an absolutely incredible buy. And the, the carving on this was excellent. The other error the auction house made was they they dated it incorrectly. They dated it as being late 19th to early 20th century. And this box was probably carved between 1800 and 1820. It's a much older box than it looked. But at any rate, I was very pleased to see that, uh, to see the pictures of the uh, after, after, uh, after it got cleaned up and, and, and so forth. It looked really wonderful. And uh, that shows you, you know, the kind of stuff that's out there. Um, had, had, had Garth's done what he did, that box probably would have brought $2,500 to $3,000. So uh, bravo on that buyer. You got a good deal. All right. The other thing I wanted to mention was a couple of sales have popped up uh, that you might want to check out. Freeman's has a sale coming up in um, a, a, a couple of weeks. As does This is Andrew Jones in Los Angeles has this. And I, this caught my eye this week. Uh, check it out. He's on Live Auctioneers. Is this really good, complete garniture set. Beautifully done. Each of the pieces is about 11, 12 inches tall. It looks to be in absolutely great condition. It's very unusual to see the a whole set of this turn up somewhere. Um, and uh, the estimate's very low. The estimate is on, uh, on the extreme low side, uh, estimated at $1,000 to $1,500. It'll probably double the high estimate. But it's worth taking a shot at. All right, really, really nice. 
Okay, that's one of the things that turned up. And these will all be in the global member pages uh, by tomorrow morning. And the other thing was, I think this is Freeman's, has a good sale coming up, uh, another one. And uh, in it is this. This is very nice. This is a 20-inch in diameter crack uh, one Lee uh, uh, plate. A beautiful example, uh, a flower basket center, a couple of little glaze pops on it, but who cares? This thing is a beast, 20 inches wide, and uh, moderately estimated at two to three thousand dollars with a thousand dollar opening bid. Uh, very, very attractive piece of porcelain. There's some other good pieces in there too, and uh, he also has. I think this is also Freeman. Yeah, they have this for the Japanese buyer. A really nice. Uh, they're not sure if it is a Harado, but it's certainly a Rita. Um, uh, this beautiful bottle vase, about 10 or 11 inches tall, 19th century, but absolutely wonderfully decorated with a slight bluish tinge to the uh, to the paste. Uh, nicely potted all the way through and meticulously decorated. Uh, if you're a Japanese ceramics buyer, uh, eight to twelve hundred dollar estimate with an opening bid of four hundred dollars. Uh, this sale is in twelve days, so uh, you, you want to check out Freeman's sale. Um, the, uh, we, 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 you may recall that uh, a few months ago they had a sale that it did really, really well. They had great things uh, back in I think it was in April, and uh, this is another one. Uh, but they, they had some nice things, and the other sale that's popped up is at Bronx. Um, has another sale coming up in a few weeks uh, on, uh, let's see, October 23rd, three weeks. And there's some very good rose mandarin uh, porcelain in here, including this very big rose mandarin temple jar. This is a big one. It's, and it's funny because it, it, the, the, uh, the neck it looks like it's been pre-drilled for a hinge because this is the type of jar that they often use to make big tea caddies out of. And uh, there's some other pieces in here. Uh, obviously, uh, some very nice furniture, some Chinese export paintings, and so forth. So uh, I recommend that. Uh, this is uh, uh, also something that's coming up. This is at Nadow's in Windsor, Connecticut. Uh, they've gotten some very nice export porcelain. And one of them is this, a Kangxi, the Yongshen period, gilt decorated uh, dish. This is a very unusual pattern, beautifully decorated, cracked ice all the way around. Uh, it's, it looks like it's in very fine condition. All right, and there's a number of good export pieces in that sale worth checking out. Nadow's, it'll be on the global member pages. And also this, a pair of uh, Kangxi chargers. Uh, these are, how big were these? Well, they, were, they call them chargers. They're really technically not chargers. They're plates. They're 10 inches in diameter, but very nicely done. Uh, uh, beautiful quality, lots of gilding on them. The gilding looks to be in very, very good condition. Uh, the difference between a charger and a plate, I've said it before, but I'll say it again, is you know, 12 inches and up is a charger. Under 12 inches, not a charger. It's a plate or a dish. Okay. Uh, and also at Brunx is this. There's some nice carpets this time around, including this really, really pretty Senna Killam. These are flat woven, uh, but this is a very nice one. This beautiful tight pattern of trees and fl or, or, or flowers um, in very, very tight rows. This is the border decoration on it. Classic Senna workmanship. Uh, it's about four by seven feet or so, as I recall. Uh, four foot six by six, six foot seven inches. Nicely done. Uh, estimated at six to eight hundred. $300 opening bid, and uh, Senna Killams these days typically are selling in the $550 to $700 range, so the estimate's about right on that, but it looks like it's in very nice condition, so you may want to chase it for a little more, because also the dyes look excellent, the dyes all look to be natural, which is important. They also have this, a very nice palmette uh, pattern, baluch rug from around 1900, maybe, uh, they, they, it's funny, they dated this as mid 20th century. This is not a mid 20th century rug. This rug was woven around 1900, judging by the border and the overall coloration. Um, they, they sort of missed on the dating on this by about 50 years. Uh, the estimate is five to 700, it's reasonable. Um, and it's a uh, good size. It's uh, three, four by, uh, basically four by six, three foot 11 by six feet. Make a wonderful uh, rug to put under a, a low table or a coffee table or something. And these rugs are very soft and, 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 and very, very good color in changing light. They're very interesting to look at. And the other carpet they have, if you like carpets, is this very nice soft sort of rust ground serapi Persian rug. This is a big rug. It is seven uh, foot three by 10 foot eight inches. 
modest estimate, thousand to fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars. It's already got a couple of bids. It'll probably bring um, over two thousand. Uh, this has nice colors, nice soft blues in it, uh, nice pattern, and uh, beautiful carpet. But uh, you know, don't be afraid to buy yourself a nice Persian rug once in a while. They really make a room. They really, really, really make a room, especially the old ones with all those beautiful natural dyes, natural wear, good surface. Rugs rugs get a patina just, just like furniture. They, there's a certain surface that they develop that always make them very attractive in a room, especially if you have antique furniture. Um, even with modern furniture, they look great. But anyway, those are just an aside. Um, and, and we are going to start, once we get caught up on the Asia Week sales, we are going to stop doing, I thought it would be fun to do videos. I've been trying for months to figure out what kind of video we could do covering other antiques. And uh, because it's so subjective, what to, you know, what to, uh, you know what to feature because the the range of collecting and art is so broad, and I think what um, we sort of landed on here. I made a little list and checked them off and talked them over with my son and everybody and said, "What should we do?" And uh, I think what we're going to do is um, uh, once in a while we're just going to um, go through and look at the auctions around the country, around the world, and pick out things that we just think are terrific, just things we like, great looking paintings, things and why. Why is this a good painting? Why is that a nice looking piece of furniture? What's evocative about it? Because that's what collecting is all about, whether it's Chinese art or Japanese art or whatever. If you're, doing, if you're buying art as an investment, this, you probably won't enjoy it. But if you're buying art because you really enjoy art and antiques, I think it'll be interesting and we can select things. So we'll be looking at you know, 20th century modern stuff. We'll be looking at 18th century stuff, uh, paintings from all periods, textiles from all areas and periods. Uh, lighting devices, uh, you know, things that have been done cleverly over the years, folk art, and that sort of thing. And I think it might make it interesting. I think that might be interesting for folks because we were trying to think of what would be interesting to do, and it's 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 not always easy because everybody has such diverse tastes. So I figured, well, we'll just go with what we like. <laughs> and so uh, that's what we'll be doing. And if and if you if you like it, let me know. And if you don't like it, uh, let me know why. Okay. All right. Uh, now, moseying along here to uh, eBay uh, this past week, it was sort of an interesting week, and, and there was some good things, and there's also some good things coming up this, this week that I, I want to talk about. All right, and one of the things that's coming up is I want to talk about this, okay? I saw this come on this morning, and since this has been up, I've had two emails about it sent directly to me on top of it. I was going to talk about it anyway. Um, this this is being sold. Uh, it, it is obviously trying very hard to be one of these extremely rare Chin Lung examples. And my my first reaction looking at it was saying, oh, it must be a modern, totally modern copy. It, 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 you know, it, it, it can't it can't possibly be Chin Lung, all right. And I don't think it is Chin Lung. But what I do think it is is Republic. And I know some of you may wonder, why would I think that? Well, if you go over this piece carefully and really look at it and look at the decoration and the shading of the Celadon ground and the Famille Rose decoration and the Famille Rose around the neck of the piece, okay, and uh, uh, all this, this, this color and toning, it's a revolving vase. It is broken. It has a break up here at the top, an old break. But the colors, the detail work, all of it looks quite good to me. There's the break, and you actually see what the paste looks like inside internally. Uh, there looks to be absolutely legitimate wear. Uh, the repair on it looks like an old repair. Uh, and I think it rings true as a Republican piece. It's got some natural, a lot of natural chipping around the top from being taken apart and put back together over the years. It's one of those things people fidget with. Here's an old, that's a very old repair when they look like that. And the, and the glue is, is dried that way over the years. It's a lousy glue job that somebody did, and over the years it's sort of fallen apart. Um, here's the bottom of it, uh, pretty typical for a public period foot rim, um, but the, the decoration, the quality of the decoration is extremely good. And this is, I think, one of those you know examples of very high-end Republic period workmanship. Um, uh, the mark is wrong. There's some er significant errors with the mark. Uh, but uh, uh, and also the way the gilding is beaded up on the rim here like that and these little features like how the outlining was done for the vines and everything uh, don't come off as being um, uh, 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 more contemporary workmanship but are, if you look at them out of 
take take it away from this very elaborate design and just look at the decoration. See if I saw this decoration on a simple bowl, how would you date it? And you date it Republic, in my opinion. This is my opinion on this piece. If you saw this kind of work on a vase, this color with this groundwork and all this, you would say Republic. Okay. And here's the back of it. Again, if you just had a dish that looked like this with that that little ridged foot rim and this sort of little bit oversized screwed up chin lung mark, you, you, you immediately say it's a Republic piece, in my opinion. It's estimated at, at who knows what. It's 11 inches tall, too. This isn't a small thing like 5 inches. This is a big thing. It's almost a foot tall. It's got a couple of bids. It's got nine days to go. It's going to be on the newsletter this week. And I'm very interested to see what this brings because I think it's quite elegant and quite wonderful. And I bet it brings a lot of money. I just have a feeling it will because people that do buy Republic pieces, that do buy very complicated pieces, and this is one of them. Because after all, if this was a Chin Lung period one, uh, it would sell, you know, into seven figures. Uh, so we'll, or, or certainly high six figures, but probably seven figures. So we'll see what this brings as, as a very nice, you know, 1915 to 1925 um, uh, Republic example. All right. And that's what I think it is. All right. And uh, we'll see. We'll see. But I suspect if, it, if, if the seller lets it go to the end, uh, if the seller yanks it, gets, some, gets an offer of 10 or 20,000 bucks for it, um, I suspect he'll pull it and it'll just disappear. But I hope he does it because I, I, I think he's going to do very well um, um, uh, no matter what. We'll see. All right. The other things that sold this week was this, was this, was this very nice immortal uh, decorated with a single figure, very elegant. It was in the newsletter on the Bitamount site last week. We included it because I just liked it. I thought these are very, very nice, simple, elegant with this uh, official standing in the middle. Uh, very, very attractive. Nice looking back on it. Pretty typical late Ming pieces. It's got the little chatter lines on it. Slightly uh, uh, convex uh, bottom and uh, some kiln grit around the edges and so forth. Uh, late Ming. Uh, ended up selling for $943, but it was in good condition. Didn't have any cracks or breaks are in it. And had a very the glaze had a very nice soft bluish tone to it, uh, which is nice. And then there was the Kangxi uh, uh, Kieran and Phoenix dish. Uh, with a lotus petal rim around it, uh, it was a little overlit in the photo, so you should have been, a, you should have made them a little darker, uh, because it's hard to pick out all the colors to see how crisp they are or how good they are. Um, here's a picture of the back of it, very typical Kangxi back, uh, you know, you know, nicely trimmed, v, slightly V-shaped foot rim and all that business. Uh, here's another shot of it um, uh, with shade. <laughs> I guess the sun was moving while he was taking his pictures or something. At any rate, um, and uh, no, no, wait a minute, wait, 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 what is this? Why is that other plate in there? Was this a two-plate lot? Uh, no, it wasn't. I don't know why he threw that in there. At any rate, this ended up selling for thirteen hundred and thirty-four dollars for the Kang sheet. Oh no, the, the porcelain. Oh, the blue and white dish was with it. Hold on a minute here. I didn't even notice that until the very end. Boy, talk about not leading with with your best pictures um hold on a second okay that's the back of another kang, two kang she plates this was a great deal this was a really good deal all right somebody somebody got both of these for 1340 dollars i thought they paid i could see paying some i think a lot of people were bidding on it as though this was the only plate because the uh the uh, uh the photograph the, the lead photograph for this lot was one plate that was not a good idea. I'm sorry, Asian art. Why did you do that? Uh, you should have included both both plates, both plates. If you got two plates. All right. Anyway, I think I think it was still it was a very nice Kangxi dish, and um, with or without the other one. All right. And then on to the uh, Ming jar. Nice looking classic late Ming Dynasty jar with the boys um, out on the yard with a balustrade running around them. Uh, uh, nicely decorated, good color, and this brought a strong price. This was about a seven-inch tall jar, but it was well potted, nicely decorated, and uh, you know uh, looked good top and bottom. Here's the base of it, and uh, ended up selling for uh, twenty-one hundred and seventy-two dollars on the nose. That's a strong price. That's a strong price. Alrighty, now 
moseying over to this. This was, I put this in the newsletter. It was listed, I think, as Chinese. It's not, it's Japanese, but it's very 19, you know, 1920s, 30s in design. And it was big. It was 13 inches wide. And it's that sort of lacquered paper mache and then decorated business that they used to do in Japan. Most of it's sort of boring. Most of it's not that interesting. But I found the drawing on this, the coloring of this, and the elements that were added to it, uh, to it by whatever, whatever Japanese workshop did this, was really interesting. I love the sort of big oak leaf uh, handles on the ends. All right, and this was a tray, a large tray. Uh, and it was, how big was it? 13 and a quarter inches uh, from end to end. Uh, very, very nice. And somebody picked it up for $79. I love that. It was nine, oh, I don't know who the seller was. They were in Michigan. The shipping from Michigan to Boston apparently was nine bucks. That was a great deal. Uh, I liked that a lot. No, it's not fancy. No, it's not, uh, you know, incredibly rare, desirable. It's going to bring a lot of money. But it's one of those great little things that you can pick up that's just interesting. You know, it's a, almost aesthetic movement. It is aesthetic movement and taste. And it's just very interesting and it would be nice to own. And, and that's what it's about. That's, you know, finding things like that. It's sort of, a, it's like one of those little bonuses in life. It's a little bargain. All right. And then over here to this, the pen tray, the inkwell and uh, pen tray for Mill Rose uh, thing from the probably Tongxi period. Uh, we talked about it last week. I mentioned how, the, if you remember, fresh your memory, the, the, these little, it looks like they, somebody had used tape to hold the cover down smartly um, over the years so you wouldn't, this wouldn't fall out and break the inkwell holder. Anyway, this was a very nice little tray. I liked it a lot. I thought it was very attractive. And uh, in the end, it sort of did what I thought it would do. It did very well. It brought $2,035. It brought more than I thought it would, but um, uh, if people that collect these are very keyed into their values these days and a complete inkwell set like this, quite rare. And I love the fact that you can see the lady in through the hole of the inkwell sort of peeking out. Um, that's very thoughtful, the way the artist did that. And uh, the, the maidens are, are, you know, all beautifully dressed in beautiful colors. Here's one arriving on the left in her, you know, on a cart and so forth. And then there's a young man on the, on the right-hand side seated on one of my favorite animals, the horse. So there you are, uh, 2,035 bucks. And then the bronze, this, this uh, 18th to 19th century bronze with the archaic uh, work on the outside of it, just a nice looking thing, nice old surface on it. Uh, not extremely old, but boy, it was nicely done. Nice quality and unusual, and unusual. And um, it's funny because the decoration on this almost reminds me of some of the stonework you see in, in, in old Incan buildings in, 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 in Central and South America. But at any rate, uh, it sold for $1,225, uh, which is fine. It was a nice looking object and, and deserved to bring, I think it deserved what it brought. Uh, attractive, lovely brown, warm brown patina on that. And then the little Kangxi tall cup. Uh, this was in the newsletter. I just thought it was charming, and I loved it when they do these crisscross or crosshatch decorations here, here. They outline it, and instead of shading it in in a solid color, they do they fill it in with little crosshatch lines all through it to compose it. And this was something particularly well known in the Kangxi period. Something they did, and uh, ended up doing pretty well. About three hundred fifty-three dollars. I think we had said it would bring between three, three hundred, three fifty, and maybe four fifty somewhere in there. And uh, there it goes, uh, right on the money. This was being sold by the Shangri-La guys, the collectibles, uh, ceramics and collectibles uh, fellows over in uh, the Netherlands. All right, and then over to this. This brought a good price. This was about a seven inch um, Chinese export, um, you know, a Mandarin scene punch bowl. The pattern, we've all seen the pattern before. This was almost a stock pattern that they used on, on tea sets, dinner services, all kinds of things. Uh, it was very, very, probably the, the most popular or one of the, if not, yeah, probably the most popular pattern of the 18th century on export porcelain uh, that was made for the West. Uh, you see this on creamers, you've seen it on mugs, you see it a lot. And, uh, but it was, it was fairly elaborately done and it, the bowl looked to be in very good condition, which is kind of unusual for these because they're always broken or chipped or cracked or something. This one looked pretty good all the way around, done around 1770s, 1780s. Um, ended up selling for $1,493. And this was how big? This was seven inches, eight inches, something like that. Uh, no damage or restoration, 26 centimeters in diameter, so it was about 9 inches in diameter. Not a very big bowl, but, a, but it brought a very strong price. But 
it looked like it was in great shape, which is, is always nice. And then this, this was, I think, one of the relative bargains of the week. His face was 14 inches tall, uh, circa 1840 to 1860, somewhere in there. Uh, rose, medal rose mandarin scene, nicely decorated, beautifully decorated. And in the description, it said it had a repair to it. All right, that's the repair. It's a little tiny chip out of the rim that could easily be cleaned up by a decent restorer. Not a big project at all, because the pieces are all there. They just have to seal it up, take it out, reset it properly, because it's not even even, and then just uh, uh, bleach out that, 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 that hairline a little bit, clean that up, and you're done, you know, a couple hundred bucks. It sold for $180, and this was a, uh, a 14, I think this was 14 inches, as I recall. Something like that. 14 inches tall. Uh, big pay, big vase for $180. I, that, that, to me, looked like it went for about half the money it was worth with a small chip. I think somebody got a super-duper buy with that. All right. The shipping from, from the, uh, England to here in Boston, according to this, is, was 58 pounds, which is about right. Uh, you know, every, everything going across the ocean these days is you know, 75 to $100 pretty much, uh, if it's of any size at all. Uh, but I think that was an excellent buy for someone because they're going to get that fixed because in perfect, perfect condition, these, these vases, you know, um, even with a hairline, brings uh, 600 to uh, $800 these days. So I think, I think that one sort of slipped through the crack, cracks. It was a good buy. And then this little bronze, this late 18th, early 19th century. They had dated it as Ming to Qing. I didn't think it was. I think it was 18th or 19th century. But uh, nice little bronze, nice patina. Um, well done all the way around, uh, and it, it went very reasonably. It looked like maybe the bottom of it um, had some sort of repair or something done or something. I'm not sure. I can't tell. Uh, but repairs on the bottoms of these bronzes is pretty common, it seems. Uh, the plates get banged and dented and somebody fixed them. Um, let me see. Is uh, 171 bucks. That was a good buy. That was a nice buy. And it was how tall? 17 centimeters, so it was around seven or eight inches tall. Nice looking. And then the next thing was this. Now this was interesting. The seller had this. Apparently he was trying to sell it in an antique shop. Remember, a few months ago I said always when you go into an antique shop, check um, old check for old silks and textiles. Always check because a lot of shops don't really know what things are worth, and they often don't get people that come in that know what things are worth. According to this, this seller, he had this for sale in a, uh, an antique shop for a while for $800 and it didn't sell. This is a beautiful piece of silk and it was around five by four inches, five, five feet by four feet, something like that. But absolutely great quality. The colors, look how strong the colors still are. Beautiful reds haven't faded. Uh, uh, the, the light greens are still light green. Uh, just absolutely lovely. Nice, look at this, aubergine. Unfaded aubergine leaves, uh, serrated leaves, unfaded colors, nicely done. There's a tiny little split on a side. That's the only damage I think it had. These little tiny splits along where they mounted it. But the, none of that matters. You can get that cleaned up in a heartbeat. Um, yeah, it was just the edging in a few places came apart. That's it. You can see that they just did a blanket stitch here at one point for it. Uh, at any rate, this ended up selling it on eBay for $2,339, and it was a, a seller, TKO Enterprises, Technical Knockout Enterprises. Uh, they're out of Ventura, California, and uh, he had it for sale out there for under $900, what was it, what did he say he had it on sale for? $840 in a shop, and it didn't sell. All right, there you go. And uh, $2,339, so this is why you always ask, if there's any old Chinese silks and textiles around, because this is often the case that they're grossly undervalued in, in some antique shops, because they just don't know, and they don't know how to look up the prices. And if you're following Chinese silk prices, uh, if you're a dealer, you can make money doing it, and if you're a collector, you can build your collection for uh, modest amounts of money. So it's a great way to do it. And then there was this robe. This was a nice um, late Qing robe, uh, nicely decorated, and a very informal robe, beautiful wave pattern. With these, with these, with these applied uh, over over sewn uh, f flowers and rosettes, in the short flats, fat sleeves, and so so this sort of thing, ladies in formal coat, uh, but nice quality, really really nice quality, 
a good color, uh, nothing to complain about with this. This was a good looking robe and I think it went reasonably. I think this was a reasonable purchase. Uh, there's the inside of it, all in nice condition. The colors are still nice and strong and bright, very, very, very pretty um, in different shades of blue. Ended up selling for $1,691. Perfectly reasonable, nice looking robe. And then over here to the teapot with the European landscape on the outside, an 18th century teapot. Lots of gilding on it, lots of enameling still intact, only a little bit of wear on the finial. Uh, it's funny because they gilded finials, and then of course the finial was the thing that got touched the most, that and the handle. Um, and so when you see these, you always see wear if there's gilded handles, there's always wear to the gilding on the handle and gilding to the finial. But the rest of it looked pretty good which means they took nice care of it when they cleaned it. Had a couple of chips around the inside, but a nice old pot. And uh, with a European scene on it, ended up selling for $438. But unusual decoration, nice, nicely done. A couple of chips around the top. You can get those filled, it's not a big deal. All right, and then the bronze with the uh, Arabic on it. Uh, these are always popular. Uh, they, they, they made them for relatively short periods of time for the uh, metals uh, export to the, to the Middle East, and they would put Arabic uh, uh, cartouches on them. Most often they did them on, on these low-form uh, compressed incense burners, and occasionally they put them on vases. And this was a nice vase. It was a bamboo mochi vase with bamboo handles and then bamboo leaves coming down, and then with the script right here. Here's a picture of the bottom of it very attractively decorated, a nice quality patina, and uh, it brought $4,739. And it's all because of the Arabic script. If it didn't have the Arabic script on it, the vase probably would have bought about $1,000, 800 to 1000 All right, now this is something I wanted to mention because dealers do this and it annoys me to no end. And this is a seller named Galaxy Antiques Infinite. And uh, when you see these lots, the reason I put this in the newsletter was that people were bidding on it. All right, it, I, I, well, I didn't put it in because they were bidding on it, but it, people were bidding on it at the time. Um, had a couple of little chips on the rim. Obvious, you know, going to impact the value a little bit, but it was getting some bids. And the seller, in order to not sell it for less than he thought it was worth, um, cancels all the, and he doesn't want to pay a commission on top of it. He cancels all of the bids and then ends the auction. And that way he doesn't have to pay a fee. It's one of those little things that, that sellers uh, do when they, when they don't have the courage to stand behind their item. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll go in and, and, you know 12 hours before the sale ends, cancel. Uh, as long as there's 12 hours or more to go, you can cancel all the bids, zero out the bids, and then end the sale and you don't end up paying a commission. If the bidding on this was up to let's say uh, 150 bucks and you cancel it, uh, you cancel the auction, you still have to pay eBay their commission on the 150, which would have been around around uh, 20, 25 dollars or something. Uh, but instead he got cold feet, ended the auction after taking zeroing out all the bids and taking it away. And we have a number of these people that have been doing this and we have him on a little list and we he, he will be added to it and we will no longer share his stuff because he's not really auctioning. he's he's trying to he's trying to run it up. Uh, there was another seller that we uh, saw that uh, kept running plates through, um, and they, they, they came up once, they went through, they did fine, they brought exactly what we thought they should bring, and he apparently was bidding on or having somebody shill his own stuff, and then he relisted them a week later. And um, it ended up in a report, frankly, going to eBay, because he was doing it with all of his stuff, and it really annoyed me. Sorry. Probably shouldn't have said that, but that's the way it is. Shouldn't do that. If you're, if you're going to auction, auction. If you're not going to auction, put a fixed price on it and admit you don't have the courage to do it. All right, that's just my feeling on it. All right, now what else is going on here? Oh, coming up. Uh, there's a couple of things coming up that are sort of nice. One of them is this. I don't think it'll bring a lot of money, but it's a really nice piece of pottery. It's sort of Liao uh, type of uh, amber glazed uh, relief work, uh, uh, sort of an like everyday jar. This is something you, you would find in China being used in a home, but very nicely done. And it's not Liao Dynasty. It's probably 18th or 19th century, judging by the pictures. Uh, it's got 22 hours to go. It's up to 12 bucks. It'll be in the newsletter. This is a nifty little pot. The shipping for this from, let's see, Sugar Grove, Illinois to here is only $10. I don't know how we can do that. And it measures, um, oh, I had the measurement and I forgot it. Hold on a second. Here. There's the bottom of it. Looks fine. Uh, 
Okay, there's a CD. So a CD six. Eight, so it's about eight inches in diameter, seven or eight inches in diameter. Um, I don't think he included the dimensions, did he? Uh, oh, there it is. Ten inches wide at the widest part. Okay, so it's about okay, not eight or ten. Not, ten inches wide. It's a good sized pot. It's up to twelve dollars. You want to own a nice piece of authentic Jap Chinese uh, pottery with a beautiful old amber glaze on it and dragons. This is something cool. You can could, you could safely spend a couple hundred dollars on that. You get a nice thing. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was in the newsletter, you also find this week, this, this fellow, I don't know who he is. Um, it's a seller in Minnesota that's gotten a bunch of photographs that were done by some Chinese studio in 1929 of street scenes. And these types of pictures have become heavily collectible, uh, especially uh, when they're done by Chinese artists. And this one here is in the artist's original mat and uh, identify, there's an identity thing on the back about where it was done and all written out in old ink. Totally legit looking, absolutely fine. V view of um, Jin Ding. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's about six of them. Uh, from this seller, and we're going to have them all in the newsletter. If you want to get interested in an interesting topic, look into the world of uh, 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 Chinese photographs from, uh, well, prior to World War II um, in China. Some of them are absolutely fabulous. It's like the old films we, we show at the end of the video. It's very interesting to watch. Photography was, was uh, very, very fondly adopted in China. They love taking pictures. And uh, also this, a pair of... Uh, uh, Japanese bronzes. These are about 10 inches tall or so, but I thought that the shape was so cool looking. Um, uh, their age, uh, judging by the bottoms and the sides, they appear to be either uh, Taisho to early Showa period, somewhere in there, but just absolutely chic. These are cool looking. Um, and they're only up to uh, $21. They close on Sunday. They are Japanese. 21 centimeters tall. So what does that make them? About eight, eight and a half inches tall, but absolutely lovely. And if you have modern, if you have 20th century modern art deco and you know stuff in your house, these will look great with it. Um, and they will be in the newsletter this week. And then lastly is this, this very nice little, uh, almost almost uh, peach bloom glaze uh, uh, brush washer. And at first I thought oh, it was just another one of those fakes. Then I started looking at it and I said, no, actually this is an older one. It's not a real old one, it's late Ching, but very nice quality. It's got a little fritting on the edge there. And, uh, but the color is nice, the shape, the potting is very, very nice. Uh, the bottom of it looks absolutely fine. Looks like good natural dirt. Um, uh, but the, the glaze, you see the slight orange peel in there and all that business, it doesn't look like a, a, a window pane, you know, completely, completely smooth. Um, here's another shot of it on the side. You have these little bursts here and here and here, the copper. There's the foot. Uh, nice looking little brush washer, as far as I can tell. It's up to $37, closes on Sunday. Um, ought to bring, uh, how big is this thing? Uh, four, almost five inches in diameter. So, you know, uh, anything up to about 450, 500 bucks is reasonable for that. That's a nice little washer with a white lip rim. All right, of course it was 18th century, it would be in the thousands, but it's not. But it is. A, it does look to be completely legit. And this is a, a seller I'm not that familiar with, Vintage 81, located in um, Smithville, Missouri, right in the center of the country. There we go, okay. Um, who knows where it came from, maybe right in Ascom, but it looks, it looks fine to me. And uh, that's it for the week. All right, uh, and check out the other video. We're going to be working on the Christie's uh, uh, video and the Bottoms video. And uh, one of the things we're doing now is at the very, very end of this video, we found a way uh, uh, through, the, through the wizards of the Internet. Uh, if you want to sign up for the weekly newsletter um, uh, for the Bitamount site and get updated uh, as things, be, you know, things change on Friday when we update the pages, there's a sign-up form will be there, and you can sign up for it right there and throw in your email address, and, and uh, we'll get it. We'll, you'll be updated when the, uh, uh, the the newsletter page is updated. It's free; you don't charge anything for it. And um, it's just something we figured out how to do this week. We're reading, reading some uh, new material that came out on the websites, so it's sort of a handy little thing to have if you haven't signed up already. And if you haven't subscribed here yet on YouTube, please do. We do these all the time, as many of you know. And uh, that's it. Have a great weekend. And uh, what are we doing this weekend?
It's too early to rake leaves. All that leaves are still green. So I don't know what the heck we're doing this weekend. Maybe we'll have a cookout or something. It's still it's supposed to be 70 tomorrow. And uh, uh, the, the nights are getting colder, though. It was down to the 40s last night. It's got, the winter's coming. All right. Thanks so much for watching, and uh, see you all next week. Bye-bye.